His first book is titled Envisioning Eden, Mobilizing Imaginaries in Tourism and Beyond. Uh, and in 2010, and like Francis, I've always really enjoyed um, the side of Noah's work, which is about imaginaries, um, that aspect of mobilities that um, links to culture. His uh, second sole authored book is Momentous Mobilities, Anthropological Musings at the Meanings of Travel. And um, that's due out in the middle of this year. And interestingly enough, has a forward by Vera Dalmit, who was our speaker in this series in the first seminar that we held this year, which is amazing uh, coincidence. Uh, Noel has co-edited five more books and uh, six special issues of journals, um, besides many, many journal articles. But for those wanting a place to start with Noel's work, I found it, uh, um, an article that he wrote in 2010 for the journal Crossings, Journal of Migration and Culture, towards an anthropology of cultural mobilities is a great place to start. Um, however, there's also a special issue of the journal Identities that is titled Anthropology take, Anthropological Takes on Immobility and Mobility in 20. Uh, Sorry, I'm not sure. Volume 18. Oh, sorry, 2011. And um, yeah, and there's a 2017 special issue of social anthropology, which is also a really great place to start um, on key figures of um, key figures of mobility. And I've uh, passed that article around to quite a few people. Fantastic article. And um, Noel's also working on a workshop uh, panel which is called Moving Beyond the Box, Anthropological Research on Sport-Related Mobilities, which we will look forward to hearing more about, and that is um, later on in July 2018. So we hope you get some really productive papers for that panel. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Noel to speak about how mobile technologies keep active lifestylers immobile and mobile, an anthropological explanation. Welcome, Noel. Thank you very much, Marta. And uh, I'm very glad that, that I'm, I'm given here the opportunity to present work that is uh, actually not at all finished. It's, it's pretty much work in progress. And, and so it has some raw edges here and there. Uh, but the purpose is also to receive some input uh, from you. And I'm very glad also to hear that uh, Holy is uh, listening because I'm drawing quite a bit on her work because it's quite relevant to the kind of uh, research that I'm moving into and so that's uh, that's kind of nice to hear um, so what I will be presenting is uh, research that uh, I did uh, two years ago maybe and I became interested in in, uh, in sports because we have a project running uh, in Brazil that was actually related to look at uh, all the mobilities involved in the organization of the mega events and so we we did research before during and after so, so we still have a student there who is uh, actually checking what's going on uh, actually after the event uh, and so it's uh, it's from that research that i started also developing uh, research on uh, uh, maybe different a kind of different type of mobility but uh, let me explain you by by starting the paper and so this is, uh, I will be focusing here a lot on, uh, on running. So the runners start with uh, warming up. And so I propose that we do the same. So uh, before starting with uh, the research as such, uh, let me sketch a bit the context. So mobility, which I define as a complex assemblage of movement, representation and practice, inspired by uh, Tim Cresswell, appears self-evidently central to the contemporary era as a key process and as a fundamental metaphor, capturing the common impression that our life world is in constant flux. The current anthropological interest in human mobility from daily home to work movements to more permanent transnational migration goes hand in hand with theoretical approaches that question earlier taken for granted correspondences between people, places and cultures. This follows the critique by James Clifford in the 1990s that anthropology needs to leave behind its preoccupation with discovering the roots of social cultural forms and instead trace the routes that produce or reproduce them. Over the years, anthropologists have studied the most diverse forms of mobility across the globe. I tried to capture some of these through the YASA Anthropology and Mobility Network, Anthromob, 
and its World in Motion book series. Although anthropologists have been rather slow to react to the alleged mobility turn in the social sciences, as propagated more by geographers and sociologists, ideas of mobility have a long history in anthropology. They are already present in transcultural diffusionism by Franz Boas and French theories of gift exchange systems, Marcel Mauss. Archaeological and historical or ethno-historical records show that humankind has always been characterized by movement and that certain groups were more mobile in the past than they are now. For a long time, however, mainstream anthropology mostly confined its analysis of boundary crossing movements to the areas of kinship, so marriage mobility, politics, so the structure of nomadic peoples, and religion, mostly pilgrimage. Moreover, mobility was often limited as a defining characteristic of groups such as hunter-gatherers or traveler gypsies. It was used as a concept describing physical or abstract motion, not as something implying in and of itself social or cultural change. The felt need to take the active body in motion more seriously when studying mobility led me to my current research on the embodied and emplaced aspects of endurance locomotion. My point of analytical departure here is a conundrum that stems from conflicting understandings and uses of the term mobility and the failure to distinguish between active mobility or self-powered motion and passive, passively being moved, such as by an engine-driven transportation system. The common contemporary assertion that the whole world is on the move, or at least that never have so many people been moving, seems to stand in contrast with the increasing warnings of a global pandemic of physical inactivity. If it is through active motion and the accompanying kinetic tactile sensations that humans find and make meanings in their lives by being able to connect with themselves and the other, which could be other people, nature, or the transcendent, then the identified sedentary crisis of our times needs to be taken rather seriously. The historical development of what we now come to know of as uh, sedentary lifestyles and the subsequent depreciation of self-propelled movement by associating it with poverty and vagrancy is related to processes of industrialization and modernization. Self-conscious leisurely variations of movements, such as jogging, are partially aimed at controlling the side effects of a seated life, such as obesity and physical inactivity. However, they also indicate a yearning for a slower, a slower pace of life, closely related to nostalgia for an idealized and romanticized slower pre-modern past, with an emphasis on authentic experience over external rewards and the sensual human body. Such recreational mobilities increased in the industrialized urban world of the 19th century, with the emergence of middle classes who had the requisite free time and resources. Recreation refers he both to create a new, restore or refresh, and to restoration to health. Recreational mobilities became, became widely popular in the 1970s within the context of renewed societal attention to fitness and physical health. Today, such locomotion in all its varieties is routinely integrated into many people's lifestyles as a way of being. Based on exploratory ethnographic fieldwork conducted in 2016 and early 2017 in Belgium, I focus in this presentation on recreational running, a physical activity requiring no special skills, expensive equipment, nor time-consuming transportation to practice as its most, at its most basic level. Although recreational running is more than a mere palliative to uh, sedentary lifestyles, Many people do engage in running as a body maintenance activity to lose weight, to keep fit or healthy, so a so-called active lifestyle, or to look good. Within this larger context, I explore ethnographically how recreational runners utilize GPS sports watches and how this influences their movement experience before, during, and after running. This case study shows how integrally intertwined mobility as an assemblage of movement experience and social imaginaries and media in both the sense of data storage materials and communication channels can be. 
Okay, and let us now move to the running it in itself and the preparation. So before, what happens before people go running. And I will include some uh, ethnographic snippets to make it maybe a bit more, more vivid. Tomorrow is the big day. Jean will participate in the 15 kilometers of Wolue, one of the greenest areas of Brussels, the capital of Belgium. Jean is 48 years old. He started running approximately a decade ago. As an accountant, he has always had a sitting job. When he started having light lower back problems, his physician recommended him to go jogging. In the beginning, this was very hard because Jean didn't have much physical condition. Luckily, he found some running colleagues who motivated him to keep going. Since a couple of years, he regularly participates in races, not to win, but to get to know new places and simply to enjoy the convivial atmosphere. Jean carefully prepares everything he needs to for tomorrow's event. Running shoes, short socks, a t-shirt, shorts, a running cap to protect against the sun or rain, a chest strap with heart rate monitor, and his Garmin 4Runner 230 GPS sports watch. He uploaded the GPX file that the organizers made available on their website to study the route and to use as a backup navigation tool during the, during the race. While you see occasional joggers around, running around with a smartphone strung to their arm, many of the so-called more serious recreational outdoor runners nowadays have a GPS sports watch. This high-tech device, a specialized type of smartwatch, is available at differing prices and functionality. The most recent versions have a staggering number of features, many of which are not really used by the average runner. Recreational runners are mostly interested in a watch that tells them how far they run, so distance, how fast they are running, speed, and also where they are, location. To receive reliable information on their heart rate, runners wear an additional chest strap and adding a foot pot to one of their shoes increases the accuracy of the pace measurements. Newer models connect with other devices such as smartphones via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. One of the first smartwatches on the market dates from 1927. The plus four wristlet route indicator had no GPS, but it did help people getting from A to B by simply manually scrolling the map cartridge for a set route. Like many technological innovations, the global positioning system, GPS, was first developed for military and intelligence purposes. In the 1960s and 1970s, the US military implemented a navigation system based on a set of satellites orbiting around the globe. A GPS receivers, a receiver locates four or more uh, satellites, figures out the distance to each, and uses this information to deduce its own location. By the 1980s, the US government began, began allowing widespread civilian access to the technology. However, it was not until the year 2000 that they made accurate civilian navigation possible by removing intentional interference. In the 1990s, the first handheld consumer GPS devices appeared on the market and the first wearable GPS wristwatches, which became available a decade later, were essentially small versions of these units. In 2003, Garmin launched the original Forerunner. Using a pair of uh, AAA batteries, it measured speed, distance, pace, and calories burned. However, it would take another 10 years before you could buy a GPS watch the same size, shape, and general style as any other wristwatch. The combination of location and biometric data is considered making a GPS watch worth the expense. Many of these sports watches nowadays, nowadays double as activity trackers. When you are not running, they still count your steps, calories, and hours of sleep. They also warn you when you have been seated or inactive for a certain amount of time. All of this is aimed at motivating people to keep on moving by setting goals and monitoring progress. There also has been a trend at gamifying running. Most running social network sites with which these GPS sports watches exchange data have a system of awarding points or virtual trophies 
certificates of achievement, and some even add monetary value to whatever is achieved. During, so the running in and of itself. Jean is ready. He arrives early at the Fallon Sports Stadium to avoid the queue at the BIP pickup stand. After a short warm-up session in the adjacent forest, all that is left to do for him is to check that his watch is capturing a GPS signal and to press the start button as soon as he crosses the start line. The first minutes, he constantly checks his watch to make sure that he doesn't run too fast, a mistake that many recreational runners make at the start of a run. During the rest of the race, Jean mainly monitors his heart rate, making sure that he stays beneath his lactate thres threshold heart rate of 170 beats per minute. Every time a kilometer has passed, his, wa his watch beeps in unison with many others around him. The signage of this race is good, so he doesn't really need his navigation backup plan this time. When fatigue kicks in near the end of the race, he is eager to check how much distance is left. Like everybody else with the GPS sports watch, Jean crosses the finish line with his hand at his wrist to stop the chronometer at the right time. After replenishing himself at the food and water station, he takes a first peek at the accumulated biometric data. Enough good news to be more than satisfied with his performance today. The simple act of wearing a smartwatch and being seen by others wearing it indexes an active lifestyle and the fact that one is taking running or physical activity seriously. Like any other material object, a GPS sports watch has its own social life and history, and it is taken up and used as part of embodied practices. It is incorporated into everyday use and adapted to fit into routines, but it also shapes the user in various ways by creating new ways of thinking, feeling, and being. Some scholars, such as Melanie Swan, have portrayed self-tracking devices such as GPS sports watches as producing knowledge about the self through technological exosenses that extend the body's sensory capabilities. Self-tracking, then, is a practice that presents a version, a version of the self and the body that one most wants to achieve. The practice of systematically logging data about oneself is not novel. It is not limited to sports or preventive health, and it does not necessarily rely on mobile digital technology. In a sense, a GPS sports watch can be conceived of as a technology of the self, in the way that Michel Foucault developed the concept, contemplating how technologies facilitate the emergence of new ways of relating to oneself and constituting oneself as a subject. According to Foucault, such technologies, and I quote him here, permit individuals to affect by their own means or with the help of others, a certain number of operations on their own bodies and souls, thoughts, conduct, and way of being, so as to trans transform themselves in order to attain a certain state of happiness, purity, wisdom, perfection, or immortality, unquote. In this logic, technologies such as GPS sports watches are incorporated in the idea of care of the self, which involves looking inside oneself and emphasizes self-reflection. However, neither do, these free, neither do they free people from dominant societal mechanisms, and I could refer here to Foucault's concept of biopower, and assumptions about health, morality, or the value of self-improvement nor do these devices necessarily change actual living conditions. The mobile self needs an ongoing construction of self, and this change process of self and identity is full of desires, temptations, and consumables. The use of a GPS watch is a way of governing the self. Its users voluntarily take up modes of practice that both achieve self-interest self and conforms to larger societal objectives, such as leading a healthy lifestyle. As Foucault would have it, governmental power is exercised through the regulation, monitoring, and surveillance of people's bodies, and encouraging them 
to engage in fitness practices on their own behalf. By keeping track of and sharing their performances using GPS sports watches, recreational runners participate proactively in their own surveillance. In other words, the self-surveillance practice of tracking runs with a GPS watch produces a new gaze, a quantified segmented overview of the bodily performances. Good health in the form of physical exercise, accompanied of course often with healthy diets, becomes a moral imperative. This is related to the discourse of healthyism, which configures people as ideal type responsible citizens who possess the economic and motivational capacity to engage in self-surveillance via technologies. Being dedicated, controlled, disciplined, culturally and economically invested in health and self-responsible, regular runners can be thought of as symbolic pacemakers, people who set standards of performance and achievement, efficiency and success for others. So what happens after the running? And what's the role of uh, these technologies? After a, 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 after a refreshing shower, Jean gets behind his computer. On the way home from the stadium, his data were already automatically uploaded to Connect, Garmin's online user platform, and since he linked both, also to Strava, the social network for athletes. However, he wants to change the name of the locked event, add a pair of running shoes, the pair of running shoes he wore, and share a couple of pictures he took during the event. Long before the official race results become available, Jean can already see how he did compared to other runners thanks to Strava, Strava's flyby function. As he is proud with his result, he immediately shares it on the Facebook page of Run Run Run, a virtual community of Belgian runners. The group was founded in 2010 by a running shop, counts over 10,000 members, and has related Facebook groups focusing on running events and one on nutrition. The data gathered by GPS sports watches are synced to a smartphone or computer. They are watch related, such as Garmin Connect or Polo Flow, or independent mobile apps available such as Strava, Runkeeper, Runtastic, Map My Run, Nike Plus, Run Club or Endomondo. And actually new, new platforms keep on appearing almost every month. These platforms automatically upload the data to their own, own online community sites, which analyze the personal results and progress, such as calories consumed, in colorful graphs and tables, and to social media channels, such as Facebook. Users of social running networks can add pictures, videos, and route maps. While some runners keep their data to themselves and are not interested in engaging in community building activities, many really value engaging in virtual running communities. Like other social network sites, online running community sites are based on personal profiles, friends, collective events, and recorded sporting activities that can be accompanied by comments. All these are displayed in a news feed that is unique to the user, based on settings and circle of friends. Importantly, a shared sports activity does not only produce individual motivation, but translates into something more. The activity will integrate into other networks and potentially motivate others to perform better and in that sense become a collective incentive. In other words, carefully measured individual bodily performances are translated into collective motivation and social interaction. Moreover, this produces an identity for the runner as the activities attach, attaches to the profile as a log file of performances, including personal bests, overall distances covered, etc. Running community members compete or encourage each other as they see fit in a kind of self-reinforcing network. Also, the gaming aspect adds society to the otherwise solitary process of running, thereby creating a form of being alone together. So even if people run many of their trainings on their own, there is always a very strong social component to it. 
not only fellow runners, but also family and friends become part of the running experience. During some running events, GPS technology allows supporters, wherever they are, to even track live how the race of the runner is progressing. Sharing running achievements online is a contemporary way of seeking social approval. This trend of sharing running related data is part of the wider phenomenon of sharing information on web to zero social media and social platforms. Sharing running data online also allows for forms of participatory surveillance, which is sometimes even gamified. It allows the running community to trace the manipulation of races. Websites such as Marathon Investigation even specialize in this. Take the recent case of Jane Seo. She initially finished second at the 2030 Fort Lauderdale A1A half marathon, but was disqualified after a close analysis of race photos revealed data from her GPS sports watch showing that she cut the course. The Strava Challenge is an, is an initiative of a local Belgian store of Decathlon, a French sporting goods retail chain. For every kilometer run, participants, participants receive three points on their Decathlon member account. 400 points, or 133 kilometers of running per month, equal a Decathlon check of six euros. The mileage is calculated via data that participants upload onto the Strava platform. On Facebook, the Strava Challenge Group offers a forum to discuss everything related to this action. Apart from many questions or complaints regarding the process of converting kilometers into points, there are also regular reports about identified frauds, such as people who enter their cycling activities as running which gives them, of course, much more mileage and thus much more points. Even when not engaging in time-consuming detective activities, many runners spend a considerable amount of time to sometimes compulsively analyze, share, and comment upon the data generated by their GPS sports watch and the applications that process and interpret them. In other words, there is something paradoxical about the use of technologies such as GPS sports watches. On the one hand, they incentivize people to become more active and move. On the other hand, they increase the amount of immobile time people spend in front of a screen. This illustrates how technologies control us, control us rather than the other way around. Cooling down. I would argue that we need more critical investigations of phenomena or objects that hold the potential for social and cultural change. The latest innovations and wearable technologies such as smartwatches definitely hold such a potential. The use of a GPS sport watch does change people's running patterns and motivation. As a mobile and media technology, they enable, support and give meaning to both mobility and immobility. Mobile digital devices such as GPS sports watches can be viewed as enhancement technologies, especially when they are used for health-related purposes. They extend the capacities of the body by supplying detailed biometric data that can then be used to display the body's limits and capabilities and allow users to employ this data to work upon themselves and present themselves in certain ways to others. Mobile and wearable digital devices and their related apps and social media tools offer new ways of monitoring, measuring and representing the human body. These technologies promote techno-utopian enhancement and healthy discourses and the privileging of the visual and metric in representing the body via these devices. The GPS watch and related online sharing communities produce new knowledge but at the same time, they make the actual bodily and mental experience of running invisible. Even if GPS sports watches can be conceived of as technologies of the self that help an individual to, to transform oneself, they do not necessarily free people from the domination of disciplinary discourses or create change in societal conditions. Self-tracking devices 
such as GPS sports watches, actually help to keep progress on the march, making the specific kind of self-sufficient, risk-managing bodies and selves the neoliberal, political, economic, and cultural formations require. However, the practice of self-tracking may also come to be experienced as a burden rather than a vital source of self-knowledge and empowerment. People may feel overwhelmed by the sheer mass of data conveyed by the digital devices and the need to keep up with social network updates. They may begin to resent the imperative to self-track their body's functions and performances, even if the decision to do so was their own. There is also the possibility that the intense focus on one's body produced through self-tracking makes making the body ever more visible, rendering it open to ever more detailed monitoring, may eventuate not only in greater certainty, but also create greater anxiety. Some people find self-tracking too onerous, find the devices inconvenient, unfashionable or uncomfortable to wear, or the apps not compatible with their smart devices. The case of GPS sports watches shows once again that technologies are never politically neutral, but rather are always implicated in complex power relationships. Recent forms of neoliberalism are intimately intertwined with digital technologies. With the aid of these mobile technologies, and mobile can be taken quite literally here, people measure and chart what was previously private, the power lies not only in individualized data contributing valuable knowledge to self-trackers, but also in aggregated big data accumulated across many users uploading their data to websites. In this process, the boundaries between self and society begin considerably to blur. And this, of course, raises concerns over the invasion of privacy and the misuse of information. Zooming out of this particular case study, we can see how mobility research directs new questions towards traditional anthropological topics. Many earlier conceptualizations blinded scholars to the fact that mobility is variable and multidimensional. People are moving all the time, but not all movements are equally meaningful and life-shaping for both those who move and those who stay put. Mobility gains meaning through its embeddedness within societies, culture, politics, and histories, which are themselves, to a certain extent, mobile. Alongside gender, class, race, ethnicity, age, nationality, language, religion, lifestyle, disability, and geopolitical groupings, mobility has become a key difference and otherness producing machine involving significant inequalities of speed, risk, rights, and status with both mobile and immobile people being engaged in the construction of complex politics of location and movement. The critical questions for an anthropology of mobility and immobility are not so much about the overall rise or decline of certain types of mobility, but about how these various mobilities are formed, regulated and distributed across the globe, and how the formation, regulation and distribution of these mobilities are shaped and patterned by existing social, political, and economic structures. The cultural assumptions, meanings, and values attached to mobility and immobility need to be empirically problematized rather than assumed. Contemporary anthropology is well equipped, I would argue, to challenge the many Western assumptions embedded within much interdisciplinary mobility studies. Founding fathers of the discipline, such as Franz Boas and Bronislav Malinowski, while missing the extent to which their own epistemological project was predicated on their mobility, showed how the liminal positioning of anthropologists among the humanities and social sciences, with constant methodological and theoretical boundary crossings, offers promise for a fruitful, holistic, and grounded ethnographic analysis of the various forms of human mobility. And so, so this is what I aim to accomplish with this project, which is really uh, uh, just at the very beginning. So I will stop here and um, I'm listening forward to hearing your comments. Thank you very much, Noel. That was uh, full of a lot of different ways that we could take avenues and paths, I'm sure, to, to dig into it a bit. Um, 
but um, maybe we'll just open it up to people's responses and reactions and if mm -hmm. any people have any questions then they could ask and then we could develop a bit of a, a dialogue. Okay. Does anybody have anything they'd like to raise or comment about? I'll, I'll jump in, Martha. Yeah, okay, Francis. Yeah, uh, Noel, I really um, enjoyed that talk and uh, you know, uh, it's covering a lot of territory in relation to te technology and mobility. I was particularly struck by the kind of the Tension is probably the wrong word, but the kind of the, the sense that the kinds of technologies you're talking about are involved in uh, the reproduction of a kind of competitive individualism on the on the one part, yeah, and that's the kind of technologies of the cell, but also um, that's supported through a kind of collective sociality of sorts as well at the same time. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering in the first instance. I mean, you know, from the kind of Foucauldian perspective you're taking, how does that how does that work? This is not just an individualized technology, it's also one that creates, that's, that functions through sociality. And when I was thinking about that, I guess an, uh, an, an example came to mind. I was told a couple of years ago by a, a former colleague in Singapore that the Health Promotion Board in Singapore had actually taken up um, uh, not, not the kind of high-end technology you're talking about, but step counters. Um, as part of a health promotion strategy and giving them out free um, to literally tens of thousands of people as part of trials to measure the amount of people walking, but then also to seek to, um, I guess, um, improve population health um, more widely. Um, so your, your talk emphasizes a lot on, you know, as I said, on the individual and collective, but I'm, I wonder to what extent we see um, governments or the state coming in as part of um, as in relation to the kinds of technologies you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, that's a that's a complex uh, question with with many different angles. Yes. I, I, I maybe want to start off by by an anecdote. Oh, it's not an anecdote. It's something that was in the news a couple of weeks ago that I didn't include here, uh, and it was that um, some some American military were actually. Uh, put in a very dangerous situation because uh, military like sports and they also go running and so these people also use these GPS sports watches and so they had been uh, uploading their data and so through this data actually other people could track where they were running because they were running outside of their uh, protected uh, military bases and so by doing this they were actually put in a very dangerous position and so after after the the government realized that then yeah then then I had to uh, actually uh, not longer allow this this uh, military to to upload and share their uh, data because they can all also be of course used i mean from the moment these data are are shared on on these platforms then uh, yeah literally thousands of people have access to them um but so what you are aiming at is is in fact this uh it's basically a question how how you have uh technologies and how these technologies actually mediate between different actors uh, and and how it's not always clear uh, who is actually doing what and and where the agency lies uh, and I think the agency is of course an uh, an interesting one and it's clear that in the case of runners um, many people who, who start using these uh, technologies and start uploading data they actually they don't think about, I mean, whatever may, may happen to this data. I mean, they basically uh, think they are sharing the, their data with, uh, with the small groups of friends or, 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 or fellow runners that they have. And they, of course, like often is the case with people who sign up to uh, websites and, and social media, they don't read the, the fine print. And so they don't, they don't realize that actually their data is shared by lots of people. And that there are in certain countries also governments, uh, governments who actually use this data. So the data that people upload to actually monitor, well, let's say the health of the population and, and where the government is actually involved sometimes in programs. And I was talking about the, ga the gamification of, of, of running uh, through technologies. In certain cases, it's actually government agencies uh, that are involved. In Belgium, there was a case last last year where after this uh, this whole trend with this what was the name again of this very 
popular game where people were on their smartphones and they were they were trying to look for all these little creatures. I don't remember what this name was. Uh, uh, Pokemon something. Um, I think. Yeah. Pokemon Go. Pokemon. Pokemon Go. Yes. Well, they they then created the kind of Pokemon Go version. I mean, a year after the date to actually. Uh, yeah, actually make people do sports and so and so they use this uh, i mean a, a very similar idea and so so this gamification and, and uh but the thing is that of course also uh when people participate uh yeah then they're also being tracked uh, and so this uh the tracking hap happens in 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 many cases often w without people realizing uh i don't know an example from from the running community but i do i do an ex examples from uh, tourism where actually people from the moment they install an app about a certain destination it could be a city or something uh, from the moment they install an app on their phone that actually gives them information about places to visit the app also tracks actually where they go and how much time they spend at certain things and that helps them uh, tourism boards to actually see i mean uh, where more advertising is needed or where maybe they should do less advertising and so they can actually uh, guide uh, tourists uh, or streams of tourists according to this data that they obtain uh, and so you see that there are all kind of actors involved and that oftentimes the people who are using these technologies are not at all aware of, of uh, all these things happening with their, their data Okay. But I don't know if that's an answer to your question. <laughs> Holly, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, I've actually got an interesting example of that in uh, surfing. With the, there's the rip curl watches that the surfers who can afford them uh, wear when they go surfing. It tracks, it tracks how long they surf for, how many waves they surf. Um, mm -hmm. And then that information is owned by a rip curl. And there are a bunch of mm -hmm. um, different research groups around the world who, or scientists who are trying to get access to that big data so they can see when the conditions are good, how many people surf there. Um, mm. Yeah, so there's quite interesting research happening around that kind of big data. But I did have a question um, because a lot of what you were saying today was resonating with some of the things that uh, Deborah Lupton's been saying about the quantification of life and yeah. she uh -huh. has been looking at these types of um, wearable mm. devices and how they... Um, you know, creep into how we think about our lives, how we organize mm. everything that we do. Um, uh, and I was wondering, because what you're bringing and thinking through is a mobilities approach and an anthropological approach, I th in part my interpretation, I'm wondering what your take is on her work there, if you've read it, or what you think, because there's a lot of people working in this space now around wearable devices, Fitbits, uh, from a sociological type of uh, approach, I guess. And I'm wondering what you think a mobilities uh, approach brings that would be different or perhaps an anthropological approach that you think would be unique in this conversation that's definitely gaining a lot of traction at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that that is interesting is, and it's also something that I mentioned, is that uh, many of these devices, at least in the running world, that were actually developed also to actually, and, and also the 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 accompanying apps uh, the aim is actually to to keep people moving i mean it's all about you know keep people moving and also even increase uh, uh the physical activity and so a lot of these devices have have as an aim also i mean by by giving data to actually make it easy for people to track their progress and and, uh, and actually uh make them feel good you know that they are doing the good thing and so that it's all about moving uh Whereas also what I've, what I've shown is that actually lots of people uh, also spend a lot of time uh, because of these devices not moving uh, because they are pro uh, processing all this data and they are, you know, on these social networks commenting upon their own data or, or uh, commenting among the data of friends. And so, and so the, the more active people are in these fields, also the more time they have to spend, uh, at least the people that actively participate in this to to actually uh, be part of these networks, but I must also stress that this is, of course, these are the the people that uh, decide to to actually play this game because there are also in the running community 
there's a large group of runners that is actually totally against all this stuff uh, and that actually is also very vocal about this uh, and so where they want to go back to you know running with all the, all the special gear and the special shoes and, and the special technologies and this is particularly dominant in the more uh, extreme homes of running so so the extreme long distances or the trail runners or the people who who, who mostly also have been running quite a long time and where you can clearly see that there is a, a like an anti anti discourse and where basically in that community if you are a real runner i mean you don't use these watches and you don't use technologies and so uh this is a very different community and, and it's important to actually stress that too and it's very interesting to actually observe during races you can clearly identify to which groups people belong just by seeing uh, what they wear and also where they position themselves at the start and, and so i mean there's there's lots of things that of course here i didn't include because it's uh, i mean you have to make make choices you were you were also asking about uh, the anthropological approach well, uh, I haven't done too much ethnographic research yet because I have just just uh, actually started. But one of the things also that I want to do is actually to yeah, to focus a lot on 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 what these activities do and and the use of these technologies also to uh, the body and also of course have uh, anthropologists and of course anthropologists are not the only ones doing this, but uh, have them really participate i'm actually preparing myself also to do longer longer run and longer runs and also see what this does to my own body and uh and so i think what every every discipline brings uh is of course the the history of the discipline and the fact that then when you do interpretation of whatever it is that you research that you then link it up to other things that in your re in your discipline has been developing uh, so I'm, I'm certainly not claiming that uh, anthropology is unique because of a method, uh, because the because of the ethnographic method, because other people have have used that too. But I think it's important that we look at uh, all things related to mobility or, mo or immobility or, or other topics from actually different disciplinary perspectives, because I think it's worth to actually uh, look at them from all these perspectives and then see how we can learn from from one another. And so I'm definitely not claiming that anthropology is the, the best way. I mean, it's just one, one of the, the potential angles. But one of the things that I must uh, stress, and this is something that I haven't included here because I haven't done research on that yet, is the fact also that one of the things that I would like to do is also to look at, at uh, the cultural component and how, uh, well, in this case, running and how the use of these devices may play out quite differently in different cultural contexts. And so I'm planning, I mean, if I get uh, the funding, I'm planning to, to do research on different continents and also to be looking at how this actually plays out in, in, in different cultural contexts. Does that answer your, your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. Cheers. Yes, um, sorry, we, could you introduce yourself just before you ask a question? Yes, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Hi. So my name's um, Alex Beatty. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Victoria University in Wellington. And I apologise that I had my camera turned the wrong way. Um, this is my first time using Zoom. So thanks uh, for uh, understanding. Um, Noel, I really enjoyed that talk. Um, and I've got a, a sort of comment and a question. Um, I'm studying how people disconnect from the internet. Um, and in particular, uh, as a mode of self-care. Um, so in some ways, my research is a response to the sort of quantification of life. Um, and also it parallels um, your line of work in that I'm, I'm looking in particular how people use technology to disconnect. So mm. the use of internet jammers, productivity apps, um, mm. digital detoxes, sort of technologies of the self. Um, so there were some real parallels with your approach and, and one of my chapters for my thesis, which I'm only a year in. So it's really encouraging to see um, how relevant um, Foucault is today in, um, in mobile technology. So there's some real parallels. Um, you've actually reminded me why I think I run with no technology um, because I don't run <laughs> um, to 
improve, I think, my physical sense, but more of my mental. It's, it's a, still a mode of self-care. And so I'm wondering, mm-hmm. you've touched on um, looking at people who don't use technology to write, and I'm wondering how far you're, you're willing to go into this, because I know I'm aware there is a, there is a movement called the naked running movement, and it's not people who are literally running naked, but who are running naked in the sense that they're gadget free. And I'm, I'm interested to know that whether you could, there's a sort of an, an interesting comparative study there um, with, you know, their, their interests, um, you know, their motivations and, and, and sort of the outputs. So thanks. Thank you. That's uh, quite, quite interesting. Uh, one of the things that I would like to look at, I haven't, I haven't done so. Of course, I, I, I mentioned that uh, that I know quite a number of people and 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 groups that actually are against technology, but I would also be very interested in how that translates in the in terms of organizing events, and whether there are any events or even uh, uh, groupings of events where actually that becomes part of the game, where actually you can participate in the event if you don't use technology and so technology is not allowed uh, that would be quite quite interesting because that would indicate that really there's a there's a, a social push also towards uh, to, to a certain extent limit uh, technologies what I see right now is is that mainly at events uh, most people actually use technologies and of course uh, the, there are always people who are not using it, and there are there are people who 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 do runs on their own, and that's also interesting. Many people who don't use technologies also don't like these events because many of these events uh, have been totally commodified, and it's all it's all about making money. And so it's it's also it's also going back, like you were saying, to to the question of why why people are running. Uh, which sometimes gets lost in all the distractions and all the, I don't know how it is in New Zealand, but here in Belgium, the, the running scene is so commodified and they keep on inventing new ways of running. You have color run and night runs and urban runs and I mean, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and it's all about making money, you know, because these, these things are not cheap. And uh, there is a movement, there's definitely a movement that has always been present of people who want to keep running pure. Uh, but they have a hard time making their voice heard, unfortunately. Could I just add, jump in there? Um, I was very interested, Noel, just in, in line with uh, these are events that are um, for making money. Um, your uh, comment that it was a running shop that first developed the run, run, run platform. And that I think there's, uh, as a sociologist, there's a lot to be explored. Um, in terms of the uh, market for runners, mm-hmm. because in um, in terms of uh, endurance races in the wilderness, it's a lot of them were started by um, equi- gear shops, shops that made backpacks, and um, mm-hmm. I think the connection there is really interesting. And quite often they appear as sponsors, so the um, outdoor equipment maker be- sponsors a run to bring people in because it has produced a running backpack. So then they wear the running backpack. So it's the same as the watches um Mm. but so i think we have to trace who's making money and how because um if it's about Mm. making money then it's about advertising and that's where the money flow comes and it's it's not about Mm. the runners paying their registration fees although some of these can be very expensive Um, but my comment also um i thought it would be really interesting to explore the gamification aspect of your paper because in in my research what i found is that the As soon as there's a tracking device that can quantify everybody's performance at any particular point along the way of a race, then the outcome of that race is uncertain and the advertisers benefit because more people want to see, well, what will happen in this race? Who will, uh, who will win? And so as soon as, um, so to me, that's the aspect of gamifying. I understand that you're talking about people um, gaming the system and, and being fraudulent, et cetera, but and um, there's another aspect of gamification you talked about, like um, getting rewards, getting points, um, and, and sort of joining a game. But I think a third aspect is that gamification creates an audience because the audience um, to an event, and I think that was something that was not in your paper that actually is a huge part of these 
um, uh, platforms is that they construct the audience by asking you know family and friends to join in but in fact that becomes the audience uh, to see who will um, win or who will stop or who will be injured and that is the mm -hmm. aspect of gamification that is um, pertinent to advertisers is that nobody can predict the conclusion so the advertisers want to be part of something where everybody has to wait and see what happens because it's that's their marketing audience it's 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 not like a newspaper where you pick it up to see so and so came first so and so got a goal it's actually the people online for a certain amount of time. Um, the runners can, are, I mean, I think there's a slight presumption of um, longevity and commitment. Runners actually can be extremely random. And, they, and, and, and if you watch kids using apps, they can be on and off. They can just say, oh, I got tired of that app, but just off the app. And I'm not used to that as a person who's I'm not in, um, the online world as much, but but um, it's not the runners that necessarily have to be targeted, it's the audience. And then their data is how long did they watch the race for? How long were they on the platform for? Who, uh, how, and that changes the run out of a recreational run into a performance run because people have told me that they do adventure races for the audience watching. They start to perform for the people back home. And they when they stop at a, um, transition point they check on comments and some of the race organizers are starting to ask them to post a video of themselves at a transition point so I thought all of those aspects of the long long distance wilderness racing could uh, apply to uh, studying running races thank you that's a very useful comment and uh, yeah the performance aspect uh, made me think of a race that was held here in Belgium yesterday where basically it's it's the first time they were doing this and so all the the people participating had to run a loop it was a, a seven kilometers loop and it's very hilly and so they basically had to repeat the loop uh, within they had like 40 minutes or something and so every time they had to be at the starting point again so within 40 minutes and and the the, the winner of the race was the yeah, the the person that could do most loops and so this was all all to be tracked online and had a live feed on Facebook and everything. And so it's exactly what you were saying. So, uh, and then I would also think about an aspect uh, that would probably uh, pop up next and that's then gambling. I mean, if it's all very unpredictable and, and, and if there's money involved, then, then what about gambling? Like you, you would gamble on a, on a horse race. You could also gamble on a running race. It's uh, I mean, that's probably coming up next then. It's, <laughs> Well, um, in my reading, in the very original foot races in England were um, the result of people, of the, the lords sending their runner to another chateau mm -hmm. and, and timing them. And it was completely for sport. And that's how the idea that sport is a gamble. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. sport is not particularly a, a term that relates to physical uh, activity. It's more the sport of who, who can best the other. And these were... Uh, um, you know, it was a power imbalance with these these foot people, the footmen, <laughs> running. So, I, it, you know, I guess that was the big, the history of pedestrianism. Mm -hmm. So the gamble has been there. I yeah. guess it's it's ten o'clock. I, I wonder if people have more to add, or we, if we should begin to wrap up. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All good. Okay. <laughs> oh no, we, I'm sure we could talk for hours. But thank you so much for a very stimulating paper and I think it'll provide a really useful resource to go back through because you've covered an awful lot. I loved hearing about the history of GPS. It was really interesting. <laughs>